scaling problems and scaling their work and some applications. Okay. Uh, yeah, and this is joint uh, So yeah, so uh, so simplest scaling problem is this problem called matrix scaling. This was initiated by uh, Saint Hon in 1964, and it has found uh, uh, plenty of applications in various areas, such as statistics, numerical computing, theoretical computer science, and even solving Sudoku. And uh, so in the uh, past uh, decade or so, this has been uh, generalized uh, in several unexpected directions, okay, with multiple themes emerging out of it. And we will see some of these themes. So I'll just flash these themes here. And one or two we will see in this talk. Okay? So, for example, uh, uh, these themes provide uh, analytic approaches to solving various algebraic problems, such as uh, polynomial ID testing. This is one example we will see in this talk. And then, uh, so there is a class of algorithms called alternating minimization algorithms, uh, which are used as statistics in machine learning and optimization. And uh, so, sort of uh, this theme, uh, the one thing is that we can analyze some of these algorithms with provable guarantees. Uh, in optimization problems involving symmetries. And then uh, these, uh, the study of the scaling problems also leads to study of polytopes, which have exponentially many vertices and facets. But nonetheless, uh, you can sort of uh, test membership in these polytopes, optimize over these poly polytopes in polynomial time. Okay. So yeah, so these are various things emerging. Uh, I'm happy to talk offline about this, but some of these things we'll see in this one. Yeah. So uh, yeah, so here are the five of the I will start with the simplest instance of, of a scaling problem, matrix scaling. We will move to operator scaling, and then uh, hopefully if we have time, we will see uh, a unified source of scaling problems and even more scaling problems. Okay. So yeah, so the simplest scaling problem is called matrix scaling. So what is matrix scaling? So yeah, the input is a non-negative n by n matrix A. The, uh, the entries of this matrix are non-negative real numbers, and Given this matrix A, I'll say another matrix B is a scaling of A if B is obtained by multiplying A on the left and on the right by diagonal invertible matrix. Okay. So you take your matrix A and you pre and post multiply by diagonal matrices. Or in other words, each row you multiply by scalar and each column you multiply by scalar. So if you do this, I'll say that the matrix B is a scaling of A. And uh, so another uh, notion we need is the notion of W stochastic matrices, which uh, I call uh, say that the matrix based W stochastic if all its row and column sums are equal to one. Okay. Yeah. So then, uh, so the, the, the same con in 1964 proved this theorem that if you have a start with a matrix A, all of whose entries are positive, then you can pre and post multiply by diagonal matrices to make it W stochastic. So if all the entries of A are positive, then there is always a scaling of A, which is W stochastic. And you also prove that a natural iterative algorithm for this process converges, and we will see this natural uh, algorithm, which is very simple. Okay. Any questions so far? So, yeah, I mean, the definition of scaling in W stochastic. Okay. And later in 1964, uh, 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 Singhorn and Knopf also sort of proved that this problem of scaling captures the problem of bipartite perfect match. Okay. So you have this matrix A, and you want to know when does the scaling exist or when does this iterative algorithm converge, and they prove that it converges if only the support of this matrix A, which is a zero one matrix, it defines a bipartite graph. And if that graph has a perfect matching, then this algorithm converges, converges otherwise not. Okay. So yeah, this will be clear more clear in future steps. Okay. Yeah. So Okay, so yeah, so we have this problem of scaling, and Singhorn's algorithm was to just to alternatively normalize the rows and columns. So what do, what do I mean? So we start with this matrix A. Okay, so this is just the adjacency matrix of this bipartite graph G. Okay, and we want to scale this matrix to make all the row and column sums one. Okay, so so initially the row sums are not one, and there's an easy way of making the row sums one. Just multiply by the inverse of the row sum. So you do separation, multiply by inverse of the row sums, the row sums become 1. So the column sums are not 1. Okay? What do you do? You normalize the columns. Okay? Multiply the columns by the inverse of the column sums. You get this, something like this. And now the column sums are 1, but the row sums are, you have disturbed the row sums. What do you do? You again normalize the row sums, normalize the column sums and so on. Okay? And you can believe me that eventually you will converge to this matrix. Okay? And this matrix is something like that. So yeah, 
So in this, so yeah, this was same for Sanjay Gandhi, and this case is converged to order this plan. Any questions? Okay, so let's see another example. Uh, let's start with this matrix. Okay, uh, it's another uh, adjacent matrix of some Bhagirav ji. You normalize the rows, you normalize the columns, normalize the rows, and so on. And eventually, you will convert. And eventually, you reach this thing. This entry will be very small. And then you can see that when you normalize the rows, you get this. Normalize the columns, you get this. You have stuff. You never reach this is one. <laughs> so my algorithm is: you first normalize the rows, normalize the columns, normalize the rows, normalize the columns, and so on. So it's a fixed deterministic algorithm. <coughs> You normalize all the rows, normalize all the columns, and so on. And this algorithm, in some cases it converges, some cases it doesn't. And yeah, this is one particular case in which it doesn't converge. We have started. Okay. Any questions? And yeah, so, I mean, same point, I now prove that this algorithm will converge if and only if the perfect graph that defines your uh, uh, matrix A has a perfect match. So, for example, in this previous example, basically, in fact, you converge to the perfect match. In general, you might not converge to a perfect match, you convert to some convex combination. Okay. <coughs> yeah, so what is known, uh, yeah, so this is Simpson's algorithm. You have your input A and you normalize rows and columns for, for some capital N and all such. Okay. So, yeah, so what can we say about the time complexity of this algorithm? So uh, this was analyzed uh, in this paper of linear assemblage and Vigris in 2000. They proved that if you run this algorithm for capital N equal to roughly n log n over epsilon iterations, then the final output will be something which is epsilon close to the other Here, uh, uh, this B is the bit complexity that field of this initial input matrix. Okay. And of course, this will converge if and only if there is a perfect matching error. So if there is a possibility of converging, then you will converge fast. You will converge in n log n over epsilon. And yeah, so this epsilon close, yeah, it doesn't really matter. It's L2 norm in the row and column. Okay. But yeah, any other matrix or Oh yeah, so this this is the theorem that linear solutions can be improved towards the time complexity. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to say a couple of uh, I'm I'm going to have a couple of slides over the analysis of this algorithm. But before that uh, is the uh, statement of the theorem here. So they prove that this iterative algorithm, whenever there is a perfect matching in the support of A, it converges to a double stochastic matrix in n log n Okay. Yeah, so we have some iterative algorithm, and the usual way you analyze this iterative algorithm is that you need some potential function. And uh, so how do you choose a potential function? So notice that. Uh, Singhan and now already proved that this algorithm will converge if and only if the support of A contains a perfect matching. So that already indicates what potential function one might use. And in fact, this is the potential function that linear can be different use. The potential function they used is the permanent of this matrix. So what is the permanent? Permanent is just you sum over all permutations sigma product over of the entries A i sigma. So this is called the permanent of A. Uh, the, I mean, this is similar to the determinant, but without the minus. So this is the potential function we use. Why is this a good potential function? Because we know that if the matrix A is scalable, in other words, this algorithm, if this has to converge, then there's a perfect matching in the support of A. That implies that the permanent of A has to be at least one. Because A has integer entries, the permanent of A greater than zero implies the permanent of A is at least one. And yeah, so you can believe me that after the first normalization, uh, the permanent of A, of A doesn't drop very much. Okay. Yeah, so the permanent will remain large. You're just dividing by some entry is not large. Okay, so here's the three step analysis they had. So initially you have this low bound on the permanent. Uh, they proved a lemma which said that you will make progress per step. Okay. So if your current matrix is far from being W stochastic, then a normalization step will increase the value of the permanent by some fixed factor. Okay. So this factor turns out to be some number, it doesn't really matter, but it's related to how far you are being from the So yeah, so initially you have a lower bound, 
And if you are far away from WHO plastic, the normalization will increase the permanent bio risk factor. And uh, you also have an upper bound on the permanent of WHO plastic. Oh, sorry, if the permanent is low and not normalized, then the permanent is at most. I mean, this is not too hard to see. The permanent of A is bounded by a particular product of the row. Uh, okay, yeah, so this, this three step analysis proves that you will get epsilon close to the uh, WS plastic in these many iterations. So, yeah, so initially you have this lower bond and you're increasing by utility factor and it's always bonded by one. So if, yeah, so this cannot go on for you. So you have to get close to WS plastic in these many iterations. That's the Okay, yeah. So, yeah, so I, I want to point out that uh, the crucial property of permanent that they used in the, this analysis in proving this progress per step is that the permanent is uh, very easy to track how permanent changes under the left and right multiplication by dynamic matrices. So if you have matrix A and you multiply on the left and on the right by dynamic matrices R and C, then the permanent of the new matrix is just the products of all the dynamics of R times the product of the dynamics of J times the permanent field. Okay. So the, how the permanent evolves in the algorithm is very easy to track because you just have to uh, keep track of this number, the product of the entries of R. Etc. So because of this, the permanent is a very interesting potential function to use to analyze this. So this is like in contrast to, uh, to usually how you analyze the uh, iterative algorithms where you bound the distance, uh, the distance to the optimal solution is decreasing or something like that. But this is a very different kind of analysis where you use some kind of multiplicative function to bound your particular process. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. So this is matrix scaling. Uh, so I want to mention that uh, uh, two independent works, one by Alan Zuni, Oliver, and Dupressa, other by Kohan, Marvi, Sipras, uh, and Valadu, they can uh, they obtain near linear time algorithms for matrix scaling. Uh, so in one line, the algorithm is something called a box constrained Newton's method. And they use uh, state of the art Laplacian linear system solvers. So, the previous algorithm for matrix scaling is very simple, easy to code, but it's not the fastest. Uh, these guys uh, 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 have made linear time algorithms. Oh, so, this was just an aside. So, now let's look at an application uh, uh, for this matrix scaling problem. So, yeah, one application is pattern matching, right? So, we know that this algorithm converges if and only if the graph has a pattern matching, right? And but how do you check whether this algorithm converges or not? Right? How close to W S plastic do you need to get? And a linear algorithms can give us proof that you only need to get one over n close to W S plastic before and after reaching this n close, you can uh, sort of uh, say that the your graph has a perfect match. So this gives a very simple algorithm for perfect match, deciding if a graph has a perfect match. So if you import the pattern graph G. You take its edges as a matrix AG, you repeat for n, roughly n square steps, normalize rows, normalize columns, normalize rows, normalize columns. Finally, you get some output A. If this output A is close enough to W stochastic in some specific metric, then you declare that the graph has a perfect matching, otherwise, not. So, this is a very simple uh, algorithm. The running time is roughly n cube to decide if a graph has a perfect matching. So I'm sure you never saw this algorithm for perfect matching. It's slightly slower than the usual uh, augmenting paths algorithms, but it's extremely easy to code. Right? Just a for loop, simple for loop. So yeah, so this is probably one of the simplest to code algorithms, polynomial time algorithms for perfect matching. You just start with the edges in matrix, normalize, keep normalizing rows and columns, and if you get close to this test, you declare the perfect match. Any questions? Are you saying it's A to the 4? Each loop takes n squares of time? Each loop, I mean, you're only calculating the row sums. Yeah, so you can, row sums are. Yeah, so it's. Yeah, so it's. So, uh, so there's another algorithm of perfect matching, uh, and 
and Bartlett graphs, which you uh, already might know. So not the augmenting parts algorithm, the, uh, the third algorithm. So, so you're given the adjacent matrix of this Bartlett graph G. So you turn this into a symbolic matrix of variables, okay? Something like this. So wherever there's a one, you replace it by a formal variable xij. Wherever wherever there's a zero, you maintain the zero. So then you get this formal matrix ag of x. And then there's a simple uh, fact that the graph G has a perfect matching if and only if the polynomial, which is the determinant of this symbolic matrix, is non-zero. Just because the uh, the uh, perfect matchings in G correspond to the monomials of this determinant. And if there's a perfect matching, then some monomial will uh, survive the others not. Okay. So based on this, uh, there's a simple randomized algorithm for testing uh, whether the graph has a perfect matching. You just plug in random values for the common variables in this matrix, and then you compute the determinant and check is known as. So this gives a randomized algorithm for testing the graph of perfect matching. And in fact, this is, a, this, is a, uh, this is something that can be implemented in time. And yeah. so that is that you want to Yeah, so this algorithm in fact uh, generalizes to a much harder problem which I'm going to do this time. Any questions this Okay, yeah, so this problem is something called the Edmonds problem, uh, which he defined in 1967, uh, inspired from this algorithm. So in this problem, the input is a formal matrix L of x, where each entry of this matrix is a linear form in this variables x1 to xm. So you have m variables x1 to xm, and each entry of this matrix Lij is some linear form in this variables x of x1 to xm. And again, the problem is that you want to test the determinant of this matrix is identity is zero. So the previous example of the perfect matching was an example where each of these linear forms were just a single variable and this all the variables were disjoint, but in general you could have these linear forms sharing variables across the different okay. uh, Yeah, so this uh, so this problem in fact uh, uh, when it proved in 1979 that this captures the polynomial identity testing problem uh, from algebraic complexity theory. This problem has an easy randomized algorithm again. Okay? You can plug in random values for these variables x1 to xn and compute the determinant and check whether the determinant is non-zero, right? Uh, and getting uh, yeah, and getting a deterministic algorithm is a major open problem. So for this problem, we don't know of any deterministic problem. Yeah, so I want to say that why why are we plugging these random values in this determinant, right? And compute determinant. Can't we just compute the determinant as a symbolic polynomial? We cannot because the determinant could have exponentially many monomials. So you cannot actually compute the determinant as a symbolic polynomial, but for any evaluation given any point, you can evaluate the determinant as okay. So that's why you only can check this determinant is non-zero by plugging the random values. You can't just compute the full determinant. Okay, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so the previous case, we saw that uh, there was this uh, uh, bio matching problem, right? Uh, and we, uh, we, we it, it's a special case of this, and we also had a scaling approach to that problem. Okay. And then uh, the question, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, this is a natural question to ask. Is there a scaling approach to the Edmonds problem? So, yeah, I mean, it's not clear at all. Like, yeah, this seems like a crazy question to ask. Uh, but, yeah, Gurbits asked this question and he went on this question to answer this question. Okay. okay. Uh, and, yeah, so this will more bring us to the uh, second scaling problem for this scale. Okay. Any questions so far? So, to do this determinant thing, so is it? Clear that the uh, Gaussian elimination kind of an approach does not work. I mean, so because it's a, I mean, you have a, you have so many, you basically have variables here, yes. right? And you want to know if that polynomial is identically zero. Right? And, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess when you're doing Gaussian elimination, maybe when you, I don't know, arranged down the stage, you eliminated n over two rows and columns. I think the polynomials that you will get there will have exponentially many times. <coughs> so yeah, I mean here I'm not saying over the field, but let's say uh, yeah, over the reals or something. Sorry, can you? 
it has a perfect connection. So the difference is one zero over anything or over that is two zero. Yeah, in fact, it's non zero anything. Yeah. So you can choose the real and plug random values from there. So if it's a non zero polynomial over any field, by non zero polynomial I mean that the uh, uh, I mean the monomials are there, but yeah, when you evaluate on some specific values, it might vanish over let's say up to or something. Then you just go to the algebraic closure and evaluate there. But yeah, for some reason you can evaluate those values. No, no, yeah, it, 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 yeah. This is definitely the perfect matching. The, it, there's no perfect matching. The polynomial. Sorry. Definitely polynomial characteristic two. No, over any field. Yeah. They will, they will, by polynomial being non-zero, I mean as a symbolic polynomial, not as any evaluation. And uh, this problem, I mean, it doesn't capture PIT of inverse circuit. It's only you are talking about uh, algebraic branching program. Because it's a determinant of this. Um, yeah, so there's a slight certainty with which PIT model will consider and so on, but up to quasi polynomial law capture circuit. Yeah, you're right. Uh, yeah, polynomial polynomial reduction only captures algebraic branching. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, so that's the scaling approach to Edmund's problem. So Goodwitz asked this question and went on this quest. So yeah, this brings us to this second scaling problem called operator scaling. Yeah, so I'm going to define it now. It's going to look a bit weird, but please uh, uh, stay with me. So yeah, so what is operator scaling? So previously our input was a single matrix A. Now our input is uh, M matrices A1 to AM. And these could be complex or real matrices, it doesn't really matter. Let's say complex matrices. And you notice that this is the same type of input as Edmund's problem. So in Edmund's problem, our input was a matrix whose entries were formal uh, linear forms, linear forms in formal variables. And this matrix, you could also write it as sum over i x i a r, right? The a r is a coefficient matrix of the variable a r. Okay? So at least in operator scaling in Edmund's problem, the input type matches. So that's the first step. There has to be some connection. But yeah, it's not necessary. Yeah. So yeah, so Gurbits uh, defined this crazy definition of a tuple of matrices to be double stochastic. So this is some generalization of a matrix, single matrix being double stochastic. So he defined uh, a tuple of matrices to be double stochastic if the sum of these outer products are all identical. So if sum over i, a i, a i conjugate transpose is identity and sum over i, a i conjugate transpose is identity. So this is some generalization of row and column sum will all one to this set. I mean this is actually very similar to what Jack Moore was saying, we move from stochastic to the quantum set. That's what, what is happening here. And these operators are in fact, uh, operators, it's called operator scaling because uh, there's a connection to quantum operators. So yeah, so this is a generalization of double stochastic matrices. Uh, if you have a matrix M with non-negative entries, you can define this <coughs> to a matrices where uh, A K L matrix is just a matrix. There's only one non-zero entry at the K L place, which is square root of this uh, M K L, and other entries are zero. If you, yeah, this condition for these n square matrices corresponds to the row and column sums being one for this. Uh, I mean, yeah, doesn't matter if you can follow this. Uh, this is some quantum generalization of the matrix scale top. Okay. And yeah, you can notice the scale square roots of AM has some uh that much power. Okay, and this is also natural from the point of view of quantum operators, and that's why it's called operator scaling, but it doesn't really matter. We'll just stick to this format of the input where you given M in matrices and you want to ensure these conditions are satisfied. Yeah, so again, so you have this input, you want these conditions to be satisfied. What are the operations you are allowed? And this is the definition that Goodman gave uh, uh, in 2004. He said that this two column matrices A1 prime to AM prime is a scaling of A1 to AM if you can pre and post multiply these matrices AI by invertible matrices to get this okay. So if there exists invertible matrices B and C such that AI prime is equal to B AI C. Okay. So there is some simultaneous basis change you are doing to all of these matrices A1 to AM. Okay. So this is the notion of scaling in fact. So yeah, so this is a weird problem. You give it a tuple of complex matrices. You want some uh, weird conditions to be satisfied under some weird set of conditions. But 
Yeah, I can tell you that this is some strict generalization of the matrix scaling problem, uh, the same way as quantum computers are a generalization of random uh, computers. Okay, yeah, so what is the connection to Cadmus problem? Yeah, so the, the natural question to uh, arise is that when can we scale A1 to the M to this W stochastic position and does it solve Edmund's problem for us or not? And so Gubbitt designed some scaling algorithm, generalizing Synchron's scaling algorithm, and he proved that it converges in polynomial time in some special cases. And in fact, he did prove that this algorithm in fact solves some special cases of the Edmund's problem. When all the AIs in the Edmund's problem are rank 1, this algorithm that could be defined and what is only if that answer to Edmund's problems in that form. So in fact there is a connection that we discovered and yeah, so this is something not to be supported. And yeah, we joined work with Gurbit's algorithm and Nimbus and we proved that Gurbit's algorithm converges in polynomial long time in general. And yeah, that this solves it doesn't really solve the Edmund's problem, it solves some close present of Edmund's problem, which I'm going to talk But yeah, I mean I would say that it's sort of even crazy to think that this uh, uh, scaling problem, which is some generalization matrix scaling, could have something to do with the Edmund's problem, but Gurbit's found this connection, so he deserves this. Yeah, so what is Gurbit's algorithm? Uh, yeah, so we have this input A, A1 to AM, and we want to satisfy these two conditions. Uh, so similar to matrix scaling, where you have two conditions, row and column sums, and one was easy to satisfy. Here again, one of these conditions is easy to satisfy. So we have this operation called left normalize, where if you multiply on the left, on this matrix is K1 to AM, by this thing, by the inverse square root of sum over I, AI, AI transpose, then you can verify that the first condition will be satisfied under this operation. So you just multiply on the left by the inverse square of the sum that you want to be identity, and this will ensure that the first condition is satisfied. So this is similar to root multiplying uh, sort of on the uh, left by uh, inverse of the row sums. And similarly, there is a corresponding right <coughs> on the operator where you multiply on the right by the inverse square of the other thing you want to be identity, and then the other condition is satisfied. So this is similar to multiplying the columns by inverse of the columns. And then, yeah, the algorithm is the same, you just keep doing this button to be So again, a simple algorithm is easy to focus on. Okay. Yeah. And then, yeah, so the theorem we prove is, again, perfectly similar to the matrix scaling theorem that Daniel Summers and Wilkerson prove. We prove that in n log n epsilon steps, your, uh, the output uh, will be absolutely close to the stochastic if at all this algorithm has to converge. So if the algorithm has to converge, it will converge in analog of the And yeah, basically I mean this algorithm was there in 2004, the analysis was missing, uh, and yeah, the analysis was missing because yeah, we didn't know the right potential function. We didn't know the right potential function to Okay. Questions? Yeah, so before telling you about the analysis of this algorithm, basically I just need to tell you the potential function. The rest of the analysis is exactly similar to the uh, discovery. Yeah, I want to tell you this uh, application, uh, this close question of the Edmunds problem that we saw. Uh, yeah, so recall that uh, in Edmunds problem, our input was this uh, symbolic matrix K, whose entries are linear forms in some variables x1 to xn. And the Edmund's problem was to test if the determinant of this matrix is non-zero. So in other words, you want to test whether this matrix is symbolically non-singular. But non-singular, how do you define non-singularity of symbolic matrices? We have implicitly assumed the variables in this, uh, these variables x1 to xm commute with each other. And it turns out that the problem that you actually solve running this Gurbitz algorithm is that is of that of testing similarity when these variables x i are formally non commuting So yeah, so yeah, so it, this is the problem that the algorithm has it solves. What does this mean? So it turns out this is highly non trivial to define. This has been worked by uh, mathematicians in the 1970s, most notably Korn. But 
it turns out to be the term school like one there is an easy definition of what it means for this kind of a symbolic matrix to be non singular in the non commutative sense okay. so what it means this is the easy de definition uh, i mean it's really a theorem but we can just take this to be the definition this symbolic matrix we call it non commutative singular if whenever you plug matrices for this variables xi I mean, you plug in some matrix xi and take a tensor product of ki, then these determinants turn out to be zero. So again, okay, so this matrix is said to be non-commutative singular if the determinant of this expression, this matrix, is zero for all dimensions d and for all symbolic matrices d by d that you plug. Okay. So for all matrices of dimension d that you plug in, such determinants will vanish. So before we were just plugging in one by one matrices that captured the Edmonds problem. Now we define a non-commutative version of Edmonds problem where we plug in matrices of all dimensions. So this is the definition of a matrix in non-commutative singular. And then yeah, so as a consequence of analysis Gurbit's algorithm, we give a deterministic polynomial time algorithm for testing whether a symbolic matrix in non -commutative. And yeah, I want to say that uh, uh, after our work, Ivanish, uh, Kaul, Subramaniam, and Dalton Markham, they also give the algebraic algorithms which work over all fields. So our algorithm only works over complex fields, and uh, because it's analytic and uh, means this operator scaling business, but they give completely algebraic algorithms which work over all fields. And there's a very nice connection here. These algorithms are algebraic analogs of the augmenting paths path algorithms of Kaul. So yeah, this is very cool stuff. And yeah, I want to say that this is the strongest uh, PIT result in the non community world. Non you can test that such a thing is non community. Okay, questions? Okay, uh, yeah, so then I just want to say uh, one slide about uh, the analysis of this algorithm, right? So yeah, so you have this total of matrices given to there, and then you want to analyze this alternating algorithm. Right? And our goal is that if some sort of this non commutative singularity condition does not hold, then you converge in some number of equations. That's what we're going to do. So we need a potential function, and the potential function will be some kind of determinant. This will be a potential function. So, yeah, what do we know? So we know that this total of matrices is non non commutative singular if there exists some dimension d and some d by d matrices such that this kind of determinant is non zero. Right? This is just a definition that we took of this non commutative singular thing. Right? So then we use such a determinant as a potential function for the algorithm. So the potential function will be the absolute value of this determinant for some nice choice of d1 to dm, which will be clear as we go through the analysis of what choice of d1 to dm will be. So this is an algorithm. Uh, so yeah, so you assume d1 to dm will be the matrices. So initially, you have the lower term. So BIs, uh, no, so BIs are some matrices over, let's say, reals of complex numbers. So the definition of non-singularity, there they were? Yes, so in the definition of non-singularity, they were uh, symbolic matrices. So you want the symbolically the determinant to be non-zero. So in particular, there exists some evaluation where it will be non-zero. Yeah, so we know that this determinant is non zero for some matrices B1 to Bm of some dimension B. And this will be a potential function for some nice choice of B1 to Bm. So, what you need from this potential function is that initially it has a lower bond, and this is easy to get. So, this determinant is non zero somewhere, then you can just choose B1 to Bm to be integer matrices where this is non zero, and the determinant will be at least one. Right? Because A1 to Bm are integer matrices, B1 to Bm integer matrices. Determinant is integer, it's non zero to this So, for this part, we just need to choose B1 to BM satisfying this condition to be integer matrices. And then there's a step which we, uh, again, similar to uh, the matrix scaling analysis, where we prove that if you are far enough from satisfying these two conditions, these are these two conditions, then the normalization will increase this potential function by some factor, by some factor of exponential of D over N. It doesn't matter what it is. So this is just a consequence of an AM GM kind of inequality. Okay? And this in fact we show that it holds for all B. So what is important here is that 
this potential function is it's easy to analyze what happens when you apply the algorithm. Basically, some kind of determinant will factor out as happens for the function. So this works for all V1 to Vm, and then there's an upper bound uh, there. Uh, basically, uh, if A1 to Am are left or right normalized, then the determinant is upper bound by some factor. So again, this needs that B1 to Vm have small entries. And these small entries you can sort of ensure by applying some standard uh, uh, so polynomial lemma cycle. For example, here you can apply elements, comments, and standards to ensure that D1 to B is small. If you, yeah, if you have a polynomial which is non zero, then there's an evaluation of the polynomial somewhere with small uh, uh, plugins that uh, makes it non zero. So this, yeah, this is some. So this is all the analysis. So yeah, this, the right thing is to come up with this potential function which you can track easily through the Yeah, I mean, so there's a very nice thing again here that. The potential function, so it's an analytic algorithm, the potential functions are sort of algebraic and yes, so very uh, different from what happens in the algebraic world. Okay, so I have a little bit, yeah, so any questions about the analysis? Okay, so I have a little bit of time, I want to sort of show you uh, uh, where do the scaling problems arise from. So it turns out this is not an accident, we are saying operator scaling, this is a ton of scaling problems that you can invent. And these turn out, uh, these sort of come up in uh, sort of by, by when you study algebraic problems, and then yeah, basically when you know this uh, uh, know this construction, you can come up with your own scaling problem types. And this also uh, provides a way of uh, providing analytic algorithms for algebraic problems, which a priori algebraic algorithms do far worse, but yeah, analytic algorithms seem to work. So this is going to get a bit mathematical, so bear with me. Uh, yeah, I mean, just try to follow the intuition. You don't have to follow all the, <coughs> all the math that's going on. Okay. Yeah, so the setting I want to talk about is the setting of uh, actions of groups on vector spaces. So you have some group G. You can think of it as just group of inverted matrices, and it's acting on some vector space V, say, for example, by matrix vector multiplication. So what this means is something, yeah, I wrote this. So what this means is that, uh, we have a map from the group to uh, the space of linear transformations of on this vector space V. Each pi of G is a map from V to V. It's an invertible linear map, and it preserves this group product property of the group. So pi of G1, G2 will be pi of G1 from G1, and identity is mapped. So it's something. It's some uh, action of a group on a vector space uh, for the matrix vector multiplication. So here are some examples. For example, you could have a group of permutations which is act, uh, on n elements, which is acting on C and by permuting one. So this is one particular uh, example of a group acting on a vector space. Another example is, for example, the conjugation action, which is also widely studied in linear algebra. You have a group of inverted matrices n by n, and it's acting on uh, the vector space of n by n matrices by just conjugating. A sends x to A x A. So these are two simple uh, examples of group actions that you know that can be done. Okay. So the objects of interest in this uh, group action uh, business are uh, the orbits of uh, vectors V. Okay. So given a vector V uh, in the vector space V, the orbit is just a collection of all the elements that the group sends into. So you have this vector space and the group is sending to various vector elements. You just collect all of them and call it for its orbit of P. And there's also this notion of orbit closures where I mean the orbits may not be closed, you just take the all the limit. So I mean yeah, this will become clear in future slides. For example, if you have the group of permutations acting on uh, the vector space C n, uh, what are the orbits? The x and y two elements will be in the same orbit if they are the same type, right? If for all C, the number of elements of the type C in both the strings is equal, then they are in the same orbit of uh, And the orbit will be the same orbit, so no uh, limits to the finite group. And yeah, so yeah, so I have some other, other examples. Let me not go over this example, but yeah, you can study the orbits and orbit closures uh, uh, in this qualification action, and you'll get terms which you are familiar from your uh, linear algebra class, like the Jordan canonical form, diagonalizing matrices, same diagonalism, and so forth. Right? So yeah, the point I want to make is that uh, the simple group actions lead you to concepts which are all familiar from basic math course. And 
these orbits and orbit closures, they capture some of our very uh, interesting problems in theory. So, protein science is more, yeah, and this uh, famous and important problems. For example, the graph isomorphism problem is just checking whether the orbits of two graphs are the same or not. So you have two given two graphs, and you permute vertices, and you want to take it to the other graph. So, this is the question of whether the orbits of two graphs are the same under this specific interaction. And then the question of p versus n p and the algebraic word is just again can be phrased as a question of uh, something about the permanent line in the orbit will determine the okay? And there's a natural group action on the very piece of okay? Again, the tensor x problem can also be framed in this question. So, this language of orbits and orbit is captures interesting problems in theoretical computer science, interesting important problems. Yeah, so, yeah, so we're done with this detour to orbits of the closures group action. So, what is the connection to scaling? So, it turns out the scaling problems are in fact very simple problems about this orbit closure. So, it turns out scaling turns out to be a problem about finding minimal norm of elements in this orbit closure. So, something like this. So, you have some orbit closure of the vector B. So, set of all things, <laughs> this, this curve is set of all things, the vector is taken to by uh, uh, the group, and you just want to find the element that's closest to zero. So, this is what. by you join two points by a straight line and the function should be convex on this straight line. 
but you can endow the space with a different geometry when the definition of shortest paths changes, only straight lines, something else, these are called geodesics. Now you can get a different notion of convexity along this geodesic. So this A is for geodesic convex optimization, and yeah, we don't have a very good understanding of algorithms for optimizing geodesic convex And this is one setting where you get do get instances of problems where which are geodesic convex but not convex. And yeah. In general design, polymer time and uh, and of course, I mean matrix scaling has many applications, but uh, there are not many applications of this generalization. So it would be interesting to find more applications. For example, matrix scaling helps in improving the numerical stability for linear algebra applications, and perhaps operator scaling and more general things improve the numerical stability for an example. Yeah, so I'll stop there. Thank you. And uh, if you want to learn more, uh, there are a bunch of resources. On the internet, uh, so there's a workshop at the IAS Princeton uh, in 2018 on this, and yeah, there's several very nice videos here, and then uh, Abhi Vikrishan gave a